Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization in the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with Fredeke Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Spain Valfels, who is one of the founders of Monarium. Monarium is an issuer of EuroE, which is an authorized and regulated Euro token for Web3, and it's available on Polygon, Ethereum, and Gnosis. And it's an, ex an interesting product because it allows you to very easily onboard and offboard to any Euro uh, European bank account. And so uh, we're really excited to uh, talk about Monarium, how it works, the regulatory framework in which it exists, stable coins, and all kinds of other things. So Sven, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So before we get started, maybe getting a little bit of background on yourself and um, how you became a founder of Monarium. Well, uh, I was always fascinated by technology and science when I was uh, young. So ultimately, I wound up doing a, a physics degree uh, in experimental physics. But I also complemented that with uh, a, a, an engineering degree at, at Stanford, essentially. And when I was at Stanford, I, I, it was back in the late 90s. It was the, um, you know, dot-com boom. It was the dot-com uh, boom and then a subsequent bust. Uh, I was messing around with cryptography uh, for various reasons. I was just really, really curious about it. So I had the foundation in cryptography. And then um, going back to Europe, uh, started working for uh, companies there in, in tech and starting my own companies there. I was really curious about the financial system. And uh, living in London in 2011, I'd been angel investing and investing in, in various tech companies in Europe. Uh, I, I was came across Bitcoin accidentally. I came across Bitcoin because I, I did a, I went on holiday to California and met somebody in California who asked me what I thought about Bitcoin. And I was I became very curious and started looking into uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and I immediately uh, grasped the uh, potential relevance of Bitcoin for the financial system. Uh, thanks to the preparation I had in cryptography and also the fact that I'd been involved in uh, some activism uh, trying to rebuild Icelandic financial system after 2011. So Iceland was the epicenter of the 2008 crisis. Um, almost everything that could go wrong went wrong in, in the Icelandic financial system. The, there was a systemic crash for the banks. Uh, uh, the, UK, the British financial system almost went the same way. And uh, so it drove me to start thinking about how to build a more resilient financial system. And uh, one of my friends had just been appointed to the Board of Governors of the Central Bank of Iceland following the crash of 2008 to help rebuild the financial system. And we started talking about Bitcoin. When Ethereum came out, uh, we had been fortunate enough to meet Vitalik at one of the early Bitcoin conferences. We took note and we started thinking about how we could put assets on chain uh, like Vitalik anticipated and uh, Vitalik um, uh, predicted and wanted to do uh, in his white paper. We, we very, very soon came to the conclusion that the key dependency of implementing Vitalik's vision of putting assets on blockchains was to put a reliable form of fiat currency on chain. Uh, now, together with uh, two other founders, we joined up uh, to, uh, to start Monarium um, based on the, the premise that, uh, that fiat was a reliable link to fiat currency uh, was needed to essentially uh, uh, help Vitalik's vi um, vision to unfold into the mainstream economy and to build a more resilient financial services. So what year was that when you founded Monarium? So as we said, Monarium started in stages. It started as a commissioned report for a financial institution that was uh, completed in six months, starting late 2015 uh, into early 2016. We started with the, by meeting with the Bank of England, the research department, Harvard Berkman Center, but also consensus in New York. Uh, and people uh, who were actively hacking in the system as we were back in the day, Robert Sams in London. So we started with this uh, by, by doing like a, a thorough research report on the, on, on the implications, systemic, uh, and also the implementation uh, uh, as it was envisioned at the time. We, we, we started mining Ether, we started uh, writing smart contracts, uh, uh, due diligence in the, the, the entire stack, as it were, from the regulation to the technology, uh, and we came to the conclusion that Ethereum was a viable system um, in some way, shape, or form, or some fork of Ethereum would be a viable system. 
But at the same time, we came to the conclusion that we needed to be a licensed uh, regulated institution in a major jurisdiction to be able to put fiat money on chain. So in a way, um, I mean, you, you guys have been around in blockchain terms, you know, almost since the get go, right? So basically, if you look at kind of like uh, the stablecoin system today, um, I mean, there's kind of this clear dominance of uh, Tether and USDC. Um, and then kind of in the decentralized space, we kind of have DAI. So Yuri, the stablecoin that you guys have launched, never really made it into the limelight so far. I mean, often that's kind of just because people are late to the party, but you weren't late, right? You were there from the get-go. So we were there from the get-go, but we, we started with a very different approach. We do diligence all the regulations, relevant regulations in the major jurisdictions. Because we, 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 our fundamental premise was that uh, fiat money has to be regulated and will have to be regulated in major jurisdictions um, in some way, shape, or form. So, so we, 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 we looked at all the relevant licenses in the major jurisdictions. We came to the conclusion there was only one major jurisdiction with relevant license. That is Europe. Uh, and, and that's called the e-money. And that's now been enshrined with MICA. So our regulation first approach took us inside the system. So we can scale now inside the system, uh, uh, whereas the, the other stablecoins have come up against various regulatory walls. And in, uh, in my view, I think it will be very, very difficult for them to overcome that, uh, those obstacles unless they try to retrofit themselves onto regulations or, or try to restart themselves as regulated entities. So the other thing that we, we discovered as well after we got our license is that um, we started closed trial beta settlements on chain um, using various tokenized assets. Uh, primarily Invoice is working with the Danish company back in the day and uh, TradeShift, which uh, uh, transacts hundreds of billions of dollars uh, globally in supply chains. And we were thinking about always how to disintermediate, the same way Satoshi thought about disintermediation and Vitalik as well. It's like, how do we put money on chain to settle invoices uh, so they can move and, and be financed all the way through the stack of the supply chains? That, uh, and how do we put money on chain so we can uh, help small companies in supply chains factor or, or get borrow against their invoices that they are able to issue against much bigger, more creditworthy uh, uh, companies. So, so uh, discovering, uh, going through these these stages and these trials, uh, we're using euro, sterling, dollar, and and Iceland krona even. We we discovered also it made no sense to us that we should issue money through an exchange. Why would you ever go to an exchange to buy money, uh, let alone a uh, uh, unregulated proxy for money. So, so we, 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 we came to the conclusion that the only way for fiat money to reach on chain in a, in a major way, in a scalable way, would be to link a blockchain to a major currency payment system. So when the pandemic ensued, instead of issuing in a negative interest rate environment for cryptocurrency speculators, bless them, I, I'm one of them, uh, we, we, we set about to build a connection to the SEPA systems in Europe because we're licensed in Europe uh, and we're authorized in Europe and the main currency of Europe is the euro. And so we, we've figured out a way to essentially mint money directly from a bank account on chain and redeem directly from on chain back into a bank account. So we're the first company arguably properly regulated in a major jurisdiction to issue fiat money on chain. And also, we're the first company uh, that, that that essentially does away with the on ramp, because our money is the money that we issue is transferable directly back into bank account. There's no wrap. There's no intermediation. I think that's an important distinction that that your 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 money is regulated and that, that it it transfers directly into a bank account. And I think lo looking at Monarium, so just kind of describing the way Monarium works is you have this uh, euro stable coin that euro stable coin uh, uh, stands as a balance on essentially a euro sepa account and you can transfer those euro stable coins is immediately into the sepa payment system and vice versa so you can send money to this iban account and then you know e euros 
uh, Euro E's uh, stable coins pop up on your Ethereum wallet. So, but but what's important here is that this stable coin is actually a payment instrument that is also regulated. It's not like a USDC or something like that that you're that you guys are having to do that that kind of onboarding when you use Euro E, you're using a regulated payment instrument. No, exactly. We, we, because we discovered this secret hiding in plain sight, uh, the fact that Europe has had a stablecoin regulation since 2000, it's called electronic money. It's been used for prepaid cards. It's been used for mobile wallets. It's been used for online payments. It's been used by TransferWise. It's been used by PayPal. It's been used by Revolut to provide services. What we did is, is, is we, we sought a license to issue that form of regular fiat money on chain. We're the first company authorized to issue that type you know, of money on chain, and it's one-to-one -one exchangeable for bank accounts. It is intended to be fungible with cash. It's an electronic surrogate for notes and coins. That's what it says literally in the directive. It, it, it's just plain old dough. That's what it is. So um, uh, because we're licensed as an electronic money provider, uh, aka fiat stablecoin provider, then we are inside the system and we can uh, safeguard inside the system. We can be onboarded by all the regulated financial institutions to safeguard and also to uh, perform payments. We can link up to the system, the SEPA system, in a way that unregulated uh, companies will never be able to. So, and so we issue these what we call Web3 I-bands to our customers. And these Web3 I-bands are, are beautiful. They, what they do is that they, they essentially uh, receive funds from inside the banking system and they route them to Web3 wallets. And then you can go the other way around. And so we, what we've in principle done is that we have linked the European banking system with 11 trillion euros worth of cash to blockchain, to Web3. In our view, in my view, it's, it's almost like the biggest wallet that's out there. It's, you can go back and forth seamlessly. Absolutely. I've actually onboarded um, a few people into Monero myself because when I started using it, I'm 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 an avid Monarium user. Um, when I started using it, it just basically before Monarium, when I kind of wanted to go in and out of crypto, you had to go via centralized exchange, right? So be it kind of like Kraken or Binance or Coinbase or whatever you want. But basically, you send money there. Like it takes two uh, two days to kind of appear in your account, and then you kind of buy crypto from it and basically it's it's a terrible user experience and it's also quite costly right so basically this magic of kind of just having this iban you send money to and it shows up in your wallet basically all the kind of crypto natives i onboarded to this their mind was completely blown and uh, i think that's super beautiful because it's such in principle in the way it works it's such a simple offering for the user and the, the functionality is so limited, but I can only imagine kind of all the kind of parts that you needed to kind of get in a row in the back end to kind of make it such a good user experience. No, I mean, and that, that's part to my dev colleagues, um, hacking away during the middle of COVID, uh, uh, making sure that, you know, double testing and triple testing all, all these interfaces that you have to connect with. Uh, because we, we indirectly connect to SEPA. We are currently two providers in, in, in Europe, uh, inside the Eurosar. Uh, and getting that straight is, 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 it was a major, uh, development achievement. Also, it's not just the concept of moving the money in and out, but also, uh, you have to build on top of the TradFi, uh, interfaces and, um, provide with a beautiful experience on the other end, um, to make it easy to use in DeFi. So I, 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 my hats off to my dev colleagues who were uh, uh, not on this call, but, but my, uh, it, it, it was a phenomenal achievement uh, uh, on their behalf. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, this Euro stable coin, this uh, Euro E or Euro E, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it properly, but uh, yeah, and, and the, um, this, this, like this e-money regulation. So it's, it's a directive that I'm not super familiar with. So maybe let's talk a little bit more about this directive and how it applies or how it can apply to stable coins because you know what, what, what's striking about what you said earlier that this 
we effectively have this regulatory framework in Europe since 2000. Well, in the conversation about Mika and the EU crypto regulation, and certainly Mika too, there's a lot of talk about stable coins. And so, you know, well, how, how is it useful to have another piece of regulation when, from your from your perspective, we already have the reg- the, the required regulatory framework for this? Electronic money has uh, served as a technically neutral, and I'm quoting this from the relevant directive, it's a technically supposed to be a technically neutral standard for digital cash. That's what it's supposed to be. And that's how it has served for over 20 years uh, on prepaid cards and mobile wallets, etc. right? Now, along comes Satoshi and then Metallic and then a number of other people who, who start, who come up with these uh, you know, phenomenal shared ledgers where you can read and write uh, and issue your own token. Right, so so e money is 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 in financial terms is is the same whether it's on prepaid card or issued on a ledger. It, it, it is always safeguarded in the same way, and it, it always is the same uh, requirements, which essentially it has to be over collateralized by two percent. It is safeguarded in segregated uh, accounts, so so it's really the user's money is your money on chain. In the spirit of DeFi, uh, uh, and it's 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 so it's so it's, it's, in principle is the same. Rega- and it's, it's supposed to be you can safeguard either with banks, it's your choice as an issuer, or in high quality liquid assets in AAA. We safeguard the both for funds in AAA short duration instruments with a global asset management company. So essentially, it's your money. It's on chain. In the same way, we your money on a plastic card if you had like a prepaid card, right? So all the all, the main difference, uh, uh, which is is the interface, is, is it's a token on chain as opposed to a plastic card. So so we're just uh, we think it's you know th- there's no need to change the e money regulation in any way, shape, or form just because there's a new technology and the original uh, legislators didn't think that either. Now Mica comes along and Mica resolves a lot of the certainty. In many ways, it brings under the regulatory umbrella of uh, traditional uh, consumer protection uh, in financial services like the the service providers and the asset issuers, uh, uh, which is great. And then it recognizes the e money as a way to issue fiat on chain. So that's one strike for my car, uh, just recognizing e money is the way to go inside the European Union. Number two, however. Uh, it imposes some additional constraints on uh, e-money, which are not uh, in place in the original e-money directive. So it fragments the e-money standard and makes it more difficult to issue e-money on blockchains than on other technical mediums, which in our view is wrong. It's not a big showstopper, but it, it is in a sense anti-competitive because it requires, for example, e-money issuers that issue e-money as token or chain to safeguard uh, at least 30% with banks, which is not the stipulation in the original direct. So it's anti-competitive because it's forced the e-money issuers to rely on the banks uh, and, and, and it introduces them as intermediaries where they're not really necessary, uh, which increases the cost also ultimately to, to the issuer because the banks take their spread. So, so I, I think there's a lot of things that need to be redone in MICA, in the second iteration of MICA, including uh, uh, removing the additional restrictions that are imposed on e-money issuers uh, by MICA. Uh, now, this is something that the UK hopefully will has not or will not uh, uh, repeat or replicate in their uh, digital asset rules. So I haven't been able to look at the, the final outcome of the UK legislation, but uh, uh, they, they, their intent, the HM, Her Majesty's Treasury, Treasury was going to build on the robust framework of e-money. They said uh, going into the legislative process, uh, and and America does not have to repeat that mistake either. So uh, you, Europe was almost, I would say, uh, they've made a, an own goal, not a massive own goal, but a, 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 a little bit of an own goal by imposing additional restrictions on e-money issues under MICA. A lot of other things are really great. For example, uh, the consumer protection uh, uh, clauses that are imposed on the um, on the service providers, and at the same time. Uh, putting uh, like asset reference tokens into a very clear umbrella of how they should be uh, licensed and authorized, etc. So I think overall, MICA is very good for Europe, 
But when it comes to issuing money on blockchains, it imposes restrictions, which are, are in my view, totally unnecessary. Why do you think um, Mika 2 and imposes these additional restrictions and effectively breaks from its technical from the technical neutrality of the e-money directive is it for political reasons or are there other reasons you think i i would want to hypothesize but i i, I would suspect that it's number one it's a knee-jerk overreaction uh, to uh what what legislative fears and 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 perhaps lack of understanding of this new technology uh, and number two, possibly the, the incumbents, bless them, are, are lobbying for their own interests. So we're behind the scenes. I bank on, on, the, on, that second, uh, on that second assumption pretty hard. So what do you guys do with um, the money that you have to hold um, in custody for your customers? We, we safeguard in AAA our funds, uh, short duration, with a, a, a global asset management company that is uh, a, a, a based in Ireland and authorized regulated regulated in Ireland. So, so if you um, we issue e money to you, uh, you and you send us money, you send us a hundred euro from inside the system. We mint a hundred euro to euro on chain. We send the bulk of it to this uh, to this global asset management company, which has AAA. Uh, short duration uh, uh, assets uh, backing it. And then we hold what we think we need for redemptions with uh, uh, a bank uh, inside the Eurozone. We haven't disclosed the, the, these banking partners, but uh, uh, we will disclose them at some point. So I assume this is also Monarium, Monarium's business model, right? So basically for, for the customers, um, kind of moving money on chain is free. There's no there's no fee on kind of having the account. And basically, you can do separate transactions from the account for free. Basically, for, for the user, there's no charge. But you kind of get the yield from the assets that you put in custody with um, the Irish provider. So our customers, we have direct customers, uh, companies, individuals, um, such as yourself. But there are, our main go-to-market is to arm the builders, is to make uh, what we've built available to all, all the Web3 builders out there. We want to share it with them so they can use it to build services in DeFi. We, we believe that DeFi is this phenomenal technology that, that essentially enables open banking in a way that's never been possible before. We think it's essentially DeFi is, is open banking or steroids. That's what we call it. So, so we're... Our main go-to-market is to uh, serve uh, uh, the builders, uh, including builders uh, so, such as you know the closest Pay, for example, and 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 uh, whoever's building in, in closest Core. So, the Monarium offering as a user is free. Yes. Right. So basically, yes, yes. I sign up for an account. I don't pay a fee for that. Yes. Um, I can do separate transactions for free. I can on and off ramp for free, which is typically. Um, points that exchanges take a major cut, right? So basically all of that is free in Monarium. And I assume your business model is that kind of the you, you get um, the interest from the assets that you put in custody with um, your Irish custody provider. Um, is, is that correct? That, that is correct. I mean, do you pay when you move money from Deutsche to uh, Paribas? I mean, it just moves inside the SEPA system. There it may depends. Be some it, it depends. depends. So basically, if I think for on most private accounts you don't pay, but on business account accounts, I think there's different tiers. I and I think we pay something like nine euro cents per transfer. There you go. So so our, uh, our, our thinking, our model, our philosophy is the same. Uh, moving money on chain and off chain should be as seamless as the experience inside transfer. So, so we make money uh, holding your money, safeguarding your money while you move your money around our chain. So we collect the interest just like the banks do. We're making our offering uh, uh, currently free. At some point, we'll start thinking about uh, imposing or, uh, or start charging for some of these, these services. But it will be in the same way as the banks do. Uh, try to um, make it as light and, and, and uh, burdenless for the user as possible. Uh, and I'd like to add also our main go-to-market in that sense is 
to arm the builders. Uh, we want to share what we've built with all the Web3 builders out there. Um, so uh, uh, we want to make it as easy for them to onboard their customers and for their customers to use our services as possible. Why, why do you think that's not taken off so far, right? Because basically, in my view, kind of Monarium on and off ramping is kind of definitely best in class. Um, and in my view, kind of, in, in it, it seems like a super solid offering. But if you look at like the total um, URE on chain, um, it's, you know, on the order of like 10 million or so. It's not not huge amounts compared to, say, USDC or Tether. Um, what do you attribute that to? Because we're really, really early. Um, the Web3 is just like any technological innovation uh, as is, is going through waves of adoption. We went through uh, several waves of adoption and then we hit the pandemic, w w which massively distorted the monetary system and totally uh, gave rise to a speculative bubble like the, we haven't seen since a very long time ago, not since 2008 at least. So all the focus uh, in Web3 building has been on supporting speculative activities, which means unregulated stable coins, which means exchanges, uh, centralist exchanges. Uh, we, we, we've never believed in that future. We always believed that DeFi would be the way to go. Um, and so we've always been building for the builders of DeFi. Now that the, this, the last speculative bubble is over and the technology stack is maturing, and we're seeing all kinds of services coming out there that, that are we're trying to remove intermediaries, then we think our, the time is right for our regulated authorized stablecoin with a direct connection to a payment system to serve the builders that serve the mainstream economy, mainstream individuals, and uh, mainstream companies. Maybe let, let me push back a little bit here. So let me talk about USDC. Right. So basically, I don't want to talk about Tether because kind of te Tether redemptions are notoriously difficult and so on. So maybe let's kind of not talk about Tether. Let's talk about USDC. I understand they're not regulated, but in a way, they are a, an extremely um, serious company um, that is taken seriously in the space that kind of custodies user, um, user fiat in various bank accounts and kind of then issues them on chain. I totally understand they're not regulated, but why do you think they have kind of, they have gotten so much adoption while you guys haven't when kind of your offering is similar? Well, we just launched officially uh, about, you know, uh, under a year ago, number one, as number one. We didn't launch until we had uh, the connection to SEPA in place uh, in a scalable way. So that's number one. And number two, I think the I mean, there's waves of adoption. There's different types of um, instruments that will serve the community in different ways at different stages of the adoption cycle. So USDC was, uh, and Paxos, bless them both, good enough for the speculators. Uh, but now it, it turns out that, number one, that they're building on licenses that are being challenged by the US government. And I'm not saying that, um, you know, that's right or wrong. I'm just saying, he, he, but it goes to the extent that even the issuers themselves, like Jeremy Allaire of Circle, is calling on Congress itself, the main legislative federal body in the United States, to remove the regulatory uncertainty of these tokens that he's been issuing on chain. So um, uh, this does not surprise me because we did our due diligence on the regulatory stack before comes to the conclusion that European e-money license was the way to go. We, we spoke to lawyers in the United States. Uh, we, we, we spoke to the OCC even at some stage. Uh, there, there, there is no federal license in the United States for stable coins. Um, and it turns out that these, these licenses that they have been building on Paxos and USDC are not, uh, are not really intended for holding all people's money and reflecting all people's money in the way that the European licensing regime uh, uh, is. So that means that you guys have issued a euro stable coin, right? But in the interface, I also get given the option to kind of hold um, a krona and uh, British pounds and USD on chain. How, how does that work? 
we decided to focus on the euro because euro is the main currency of Europe. So we built a, an interface between the uh, SEPA and blockchains, and and we're, our main focus is on serving our customers that want to use euro or check. But the actually the first currency we issued on chain a uh, under our e money license in 2019 uh, was the Icelandic krona, and that was in July of 2019, a month after we got our license uh, approved by the uh, Icelandic regulator, and then. Um, so officially, the Iceland Krona is the first fully authorized uh, fiat currency on chain. Uh, we followed uh, shortly thereafter with uh, with trials using euros, and dollars, and sterling, and we we're able to issue both dollars and sterling uh, at scale uh, when we decide to focus on dollars and sterling. Um, the European uh, e-money directive allows the issuers to issue e-money denominated in any currency that qualifies uh, 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 in a way that you can safe keep it in the correct way. That's one thing that MICA also breaks, uh, incidentally, because MICA essentially makes it more difficult to issue non-European currencies uh, on chain, which we think is is, is uh, not really necessary uh, at all. Cool. I'd like to talk a bit about CBDCs I know a lot of our listeners are probably going to like roll their eyes at this topic, but <laughs> it's uh, it's it's an interesting topic because it, I think for a lot of people, they see it as a concept that is at best useless in the face of like cryptocurrencies and other stable coins, and at worst, uh, a very sinister uh, attempt by governments and central banks to fully control the flows of money and, and particularly in the hands of their citizens. And there are some some fears there that CBDCs become a Chinese-like social scoring s- system or become integrated in like very, uh, uh, very per- uh, pervasive system of, of surveillance. So your, your co-founder, Jan, was previously the chairman of the Icelandic Central Bank Supervisory Board. And you know, he's talked about the right approach for for central banks as they enter this world of uh, digital money and and a, in a world I, I think where we could qualify as having a broader diversity of money like assets and and a, a, a greater ease to create money like assets. You know, what are your thoughts on on central banks entering this space broadly? But back in the brick and mortar day, did you ever go to the high street or main street and and make a deposit or withdrawal at the central bank? No. No. Okay. So central banks are not set up to serve non-financial institutions or uh, consumers. Um, if they want to do so online, it will require a major policy change. It is not really up to them to do the KYC AML uh, experiment and explore with the interfaces that are needed to serve, uh, you know, different market segments. I, I think CBDC is not going to happen. I, I, I think it's a really bad idea. And it's not, not just me who thinks this. It's like senior economists at the IMF have actually argued for the opposite, that, that instead of uh, uh, central banks experimenting with CBDC, what they really should do is to take these non-bank decentralized issuers like e-money companies and give them full access to central bank uh, facilities and issue digital currency through them. I think that's by far the best way to go. This idea is articulated in a beautiful paper by two senior IMF economists called The Rise of Digital Money, issued in 2019. Uh, I, I encourage everybody in DeFi to read this paper because coming from the opposite side from the technology stack, this is the the... I, I think this, this is the canonical paper in TradFi, which explains how the TradFi fiat system should be set up to make it decentralized, resilient, robust. So uh, CBDC shouldn't happen and is not going to happen in my opinion. But the ECB has announced a CBDC project. And as far as I know, people like Christine Lagarde are very bullish on this idea. Uh, and you know, very, fairly uh, have offered fairly bearish sentiments on on the, on private stable coins. Uh, do do you think that at the highest level of 
EU policymakers, there is a desire to want to control more of the monetary stack and and get into, you know, uh, doing KYC and, you know, is there is there something more sinister here that people should be concerned about? I wouldn't call it sinister. I would call it dirigist in the French spirit, right? It's, uh, there is a tendency always in government uh, to to expand and to encroach on the private sector to a certain degree and vice versa. There's this constant tension between private public in these co- these countries that we call democracies and, and free market uh, countries in the world. I think there uh, the ECP is totally overreaching. I think it's totally uh, misunderstanding its mandate. And I, I think they should just back off and instead of trying to compete with many of the companies that they're supposed to be serving and in some cases regulating, they should uh, instead uh, support them. Uh, so, so I think they're absolutely on the wrong track and they should totally uh, cease to uh, experiment with CBC. So in the um, ECB foray into the CBC um, realm, um, the current idea is that every citizen will only be allowed to hold a limited amount of euros with um, the ECB uh, to pro- to protect the um, the remaining banking se- sector, legacy and non-legacy, um, t- t- because basically the the fear is that citizens will just want to hold um, their assets with um, the central bank rather than with the retail bank. How, how do you see that? No, that's also what the economists have proposed, is that you, what you can do is you can give um, non-banks and banks separate reserve facilities at the EC, uh, ECP or any other central bank. So you could, you could control the influx and outflow of money in a way that's similar to how you incentivize the banks to... Um, to hold or not hold money with the central bank, right? So there's ways of managing um, uh, that uh, risk of flight, as it were, away from the banks. But what is also I- important to understand is that I think uh, introducing a non-bank alternative for holding money and, and issuing money on blockchain on, or any other technological medium it is a way to essentially put checks on the banks and make them more responsible in their behavior uh, so so that they're more mindful of the outflow at risk, as it were, if they make, uh, in the case that they make bad loans. The banking system is 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 not going to go away, and it should be a core part of the financial system, but it is highly inefficient. It, it is very inefficient because, number one, it transmits liquidity really, really inefficiently, and number two, it, it's very expensive to set up a bank and maintain. So, so it's it's... The banks need an alternative, as it were, to 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 keep them competitive. Eh? And, but of course, you you have to experiment with the alternatives in a responsible way, so as to not to increase systemic risk. Now, I think the way to do this is to open access to central bank facilities to non-bank issuers. But you know, of course, you have to be mindful at the same time that you you want to uh, perhaps put caps on how much the the non bank issuers could safeguard with the central banks, etc. Um, but but that's 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 more of a deep macro discussion that I'm prepared to do on the epicenter at this stage. Let's maybe kind of go to the smaller realm of IBANs and EU banking, kind of on a practical level, right? So, w- what have been your biggest challenges working from within and out of the SEPA system? There's a lot of challenges. SEPA system is, you would think SEPA system is standard, uh, but it isn't. And each financial service provider has different types of implementations of SEPA. So it's, it's getting SEPA to work, They're building on an interface that is stable and, uh, and consistent uh, and is supposed to follow the SEPA standard. Is it, it, it takes a while. So, so so SEPA maybe, itself, maybe just a, sorry sorry to interrupt, but maybe just describing what the SEPA system is could be a good starting point here because I, I realize that probably a lot of our listeners are in the states and or not in Europe and don't really know what SEPA is. Se- SEPA is, is essentially at the core; it's just a bunch of XML files. So it's it's one one bank says I want to 
uh, uh, credit something to your account and debit from my account or vice versa, they send an XML file to a centralized intermediary and boom, it, then it clears. So one back debits and one another back credits and, and, and your money moves. So that's all it is. But it's a relatively new way of moving money in that sense because the euro is a very new currency. So, so the, the, the main payment systems for the euro got built relatively recently. So it's XML files as opposed to something even more archaic. Um, so, um, but all it is able to do, SEPA, is to uh, debit from your account and credit to somebody else's account inside this system of European uh, euro supporting banks, right? So, but what, what we do is essentially built on top of a, a payment provider uh, inside that system. We accept that when, whenever there's a SEPA uh, uh, payment instruction that comes to us, uh, uh, we receive money from inside the system. It's credited to an account that we hold on behalf of the customers. And then we issue in return uh, a token corresponding to the inbound on a blockchain. Now, going the other way, we receive uh, a burn instruction essentially from a blockchain and uh, burn you know, 100 euros from Gnosis, for example. And then what we do is that we, we, we send into the SEPA system, okay? We know where it's coming from. This is a 0x address somewhere on our chain. Uh, there's a link to uh, a customer that we support. And, and then we send it back to wherever it's supposed to go. The, the magic here is that you have to understand that a customer that has our Web3 iBot in their name can receive not just from their own account, but from any account inside the system. So if you hold a Web3 IBAN that is linked to your Web3 wallet, you could receive from any of your friends, from companies that you're billing, um, or, or, or from any account that, that is inside this system, euros, and then you can send also outbound to any IBAN using our uh, uh, Web3 service, IBAN service as it were. You can send back to your friends uh, uh, and suffer whatever you want or pay a bill wherever you like. We actually have a customer that paid their tax bill recently uh, in the Netherlands uh, using our URI on chain. Uh, they burnt the money from uh, a blockchain. They sent it into the SEPA with a string. Uh, SEPA has a, a, a way for you to send like a, a comment or, or a string along with the payment into the Dutch bank, Dutch tax authorities uh, bank account. And then uh, next time they had a statement uh, of their tax uh, debt, uh, that payment was reflected uh, as suffered. So my Monarium IBAN um, is a Spanish IBAN. H how do you determine kind of who gets what nationality of IBAN or does everyone get Spanish? No, we, we, we're, we're about to support more IBATs. IBATs were set up in the days when everything was kind of regional in, in, in Europe. So, so the IBAT is constructed to have first a country prefix and then, uh, you know, a, a institution identifier and then a bank account identifier and a bunch of other stuff. So, so, but it's, it, it's really irrelevant in the modern day and age because we ultimately safeguard the money inside the Eurozone at AAA in Ireland in a bank in Estonia. Uh, so, so it doesn't really have, yeah, yeah, the prefix that you use have, has nothing to do with how the money is safeguarded. It, it is true, totally archaic and, and, it, and it reflects the, the Europe as it existed before the four freedoms and the European Union in its modern uh, form uh, came about. Well, I, I, I agree that it's archaic. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, I think it does make. I think the the the, the IBAN prefix. I think to to certain institutions does make a difference. My my feeling interacting with SEPA and like neo banks and traditional banks in Europe, or at least in France, feel it feels like there's a multi tier system where you have traditional national banks at the top. You know, like the Deutsche Bank or BNP or you know, Santander or whatever. Like these big national banks that 
effectively control most of the banking sector. And then there are um, sort of second tier banks and payment service providers uh, who are you know the neo banks, the N26 is the Revoluts, uh, who are operating in the SEPA system, but are very much relying on a traditional banking system. And what I've experienced is I've experienced a lot of what we call IBAN discrimination, which is a um, either an institution like your uh, or, or a company like it could be your cell phone provider or your electricity provider refuse to withdraw funds from an IBAN that doesn't start with the country in which you're in. And I've actually recently encountered a situation where I tried to withdraw funds from uh, sort of like a life insurance policy type, you know, investment account to, you know, a, a, a bank account outside of France that I own, where it was outright refused by by the French um, f- financial institution. So I think a lot of people experience this IBAN discrimination, which is actually illegal in Europe. You know, Article 9 of, of the SEPA regulation prohibits it. Um, is this something that your customers have encountered? And how do you think pe- how do you think we should combat this? Because like it, it's contrary to everything that I think um, the European Union or the sort of ethos of the European Union stands for. Uh, we, we intend to offer more I bands. Uh, you know, it's the market. Let the market decide. If you want a German I band, we'll we'll provide it to you eventually. Uh, and we, it's in our roadmap to support more country I bands. Uh, IBAN is a standard that exists not only in Europe, but also in, in some places outside of Europe. So, so we'd be happy to support whatever country IBAN essentially that our customers uh, would like to have. I mean, uh, do make your own IBAN uh, is almost our philosophy in that way, shape or form. But at the same time, I think uh, long term uh, with fiat and gradually we're going to move on chain. We will start stop thinking in terms of IBANs will stop thinking in terms of uh, also zero acts. It will just be, there will be some something seamless, there will be some identity on top of all of that that masks all that identity. It's like, we, we don't really care about IP numbers, do we? I mean, and uh, they're hierarchical in, in another way, shape or form. An, an iPad should, you know, not really be uh, an issue uh, inside the common market of Europe. Uh, and I regret that, you know, but it's still a fact that in, in people's heads that, that, that they, the Europe is not yet united enough that people uh, think of in European terms as opposed to country terms. Do you think that this IBAN discrimination is motivated by political, uh, for political reasons, or is it compliance pressures that banks have? Like, what, What's the reasoning behind this? We all have our prejudices uh, uh, about which are which are our biases are built in based on our experiences, and uh, I think, regrettably, it's it's just a manifestation of the fact that Europe is not integrated enough yet that people still think in terms of of country codes. There, there's some, I would say, perhaps there's cultural divisions that that uh, people are more comfortable dealing with people of the same type of culture. Um, uh, so, so it's just a reflection of this human trait, and and the way to counter it is number one: okay, give people what they want. Uh, if you want a Spanish iPhone or Estonian iPhone or a Danish iPhone, then you know, bless you, you can have whatever you want. But at the same time, realize that you know, with with respect to Europe, it, it, it four freedoms should make it irrelevant where you hold your money, um, and what, whatever the prefix of your iPhone account is. Which. Um, countries outside of Europe use the IBAN, or maybe which other countries don't use the IBAN system? Well, uh, the Europeans, for uh, no, the, the Americans, for example, um, and it's Fourth of July. Uh, happy Fourth of July! Uh, the Americans don't use IBANs. The, the Americans have their own way of doing things in many ways, and 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 they have their own routing systems, routing number, account numbers, which is uh, more archaic than the European system because it's older. It's it's been built uh, more. Um, European systems are built more recently. I, I'm not aware of uh, the banking systems. I've not looked deeply into many uh, banking systems outside of Europe, but I know that parts of the Middle East and I think parts of South America uh, use IPAN, which is the European standard. So European standards in banking are actually um, relatively widespread. Uh, 
not as widespread as the European mobile standard GSM, but but which became the dominant standard in the world. But but they're, they they spread it seems naturally to countries that are affiliated with Europe through traditional ties or, or something like that. Okay, and um, so basically to kind of um, onboard as a user of Monarium um, to get an IBAN, you have to go through like KYC. Do you have jurisdictional constraints? So kind of say, I mean, I'm I'm very obviously a German person and I, I was allowed to go through it. But say if I were a US person or an Argentinian, w- would I be allowed to get a Monar- Monarium account? The, the way it works in Europe is that we... we have common European laws that uh, uh, support the four freedoms, which means all the regulators are supposed to uh, uh, operate in the same way. We have a license in Iceland. We are passported across Europe, so we can serve anyone inside of Europe. We can onboard anybody that's inside of Europe, uh, uh, but not outside, except with the permission of a regulator and except with the permission of the, the, the local regulator in the place where we intend to serve. There's something called reverse solicitation in finance, which means that if you're not really seeking uh, to serve somebody outside of your jurisdiction, they can come to you. But well, right now, we're still a very small company, uh, and uh, and Europe is a big marketplace for us. We, we focus on uh, European customers, meaning uh, and the European member states and the UK and Switzerland. Okay, so now we've talked about nation states for a while. Let's talk about the DeFi ecosystem and stables that, that we've seen there, right? So basically, there's fundamentally different stable concepts that we see on a daily basis. So there's like the uh, fully off-chain backed, kind of like you guys and Circle and probably also Tether and so on. Um, and then there is um, over-collateralized on-chain, so kind of the maker dies um, of the world. Um and then there is um, the algo stables, right? How, how do you see this landscape? A lot of what is happening on chain actually uh, will eventually come inside regulatory umbrellas because it, it seems to be new, but it really isn't new. Uh, 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 well, what is really new uh, on blockchain, for example, like Bitcoin, it is an asset that is truly virtual, backed by energy consumption, proof of work, and it has no uh, representation in, in the fiscal world. But the qualities of Bitcoin, nevertheless, um, are, are, are similar to another uh, traditional currency, gold, uh, in a way that, that, that the European Union recognized that. So it brought the Bitcoin under the same uh, value-added tax umbrella as gold. So European Union has already recognized, whoa, okay, we have this phenomenal virtual thing called Bitcoin, which is backed by essentially energy consumption. It's got the same properties and qualities as, as gold. So, so, so it's a pure virtual commodity. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin, in my view, is a beautiful construct in, in technical ways and, and, and other ways as well. Now, on the other hand, you have these, coming from the other side, assets that are trying to replicate what already exists like traditional money, fiat money, like what we're doing. Uh, and there's different ways of doing that. So our view on that was to go uh, using a vehicle and a regulatory license that was already proven and tested, battle tested over two decades in a major jurisdiction. So how, in a sense, you could say e-money that we built on, uh, which is the, in our view, the ultimate stablecoin, is algorithmic in a way that, that there is a that there are there are constraints on how you can safeguard the assets. So you must only uh, safeguard when high quality, liquid, low volatility assets, and you must over collateralize. You have, must have a buffer of your own capital to protect against fluctuation in the value of the underlying assets. Right. So so in in, in some sense that's an algorithm, so to speak, uh, and we, uh, which is which is proven and, and, and tested because e-money has been very robust over the past two decades. Coming from the other side, you look at, you know, if you want to construct an algorithmic stablecoin that's supposed to reflect something, 
then you know, where do you start? Where do you start? Where if your premise is uh, how do you back it and, and where do you back it? And uh, when it comes to fiat, regular money and stable coins, the safest way, in my view, is always to back it up with assets which are high quality, low volatility, highly liquid, and denominated in the same currency. So, so I, for all these other experiments for fiat stable coins, algorithmic or otherwise, bless them, you know, good luck to them. But be mindful of the risk if you try to back it up uh, with something that's denominated in another currency, something that is not even denominated in the currency, like a commodity, because it always just increases the volatility. Sometimes it, it decreases the liquidity. Uh, so just be mindful of what you try to reflect uh, and, and try to connect it with the way you're supposed to back it up. How do you see um, the onboarding of real world assets into kind of collaterals here? That is the big wave ahead. Real world assets on trade. Uh, that's what we're really seeing in our pipeline today. It, it's uh, it's not just it's equities. It's uh, other securities like uh, asset backed debt. Uh, in my view, that that will be the big main wave of adoption. We're seeing some of the early mainstream adopters coming to us now and uh, starting implementing such pro projects uh, ranging from carbon credit tokens to asset backed debt and ETFs of equities. So so it's it's just brilliant. That's the big wave of adoption that's coming out. And that type of asset or chain needs number one, a regulated fiat token on chain to self against. And number two, it needs a direct connection to the uh, uh, payment systems of the major currencies. Because it, the, the, these use cases are not going to come online unless there's re reliable fiat on chain, which has is directly redeemable into a bank account. We provide just that. Very cool. Um, I'm, uh, I just onboarded Monarium uh, like today, and so I'm like really excited to start using it. And I can see all kinds of use cases for this. Uh, including personal, but also like business use cases. So what can people um, expect in the coming months and how can people start using Manier? Uh, well, our main go to market has always been to arm the builders. We have this direct uh, consumer, direct company offering almost as a showcase. So if you come to us and onboard as a user uh, directly or for your company, then we'll find, we'll serve you and we'll, uh, uh, please tell us what, what we are doing uh, because we love to the market's still discovering what you could do with money on chain. Uh, but when it comes to the the, the, the builders, the Web3 builders, uh, uh, it's for them, we're almost like listening to what they're telling us, what can happen. And and, and, the, and the, the main builders that are coming to us now are these uh, tokenization platforms uh, uh, that are bringing real world assets on chain. Uh, and that's going to be a huge wave of adoption it will be much bigger than the crypto speculative bubble that we just went through. And uh, uh, unlike also the speculation, the, these are recurring um, use cases that they're, they're not going to go away. If you should take down a crypto today, and you know, you know, a few speculators would be out of pocket and they would be you know hurt. But if you, t if you take down PayPal or Stripe, a lot of people, mainstream business would cease to exist. So the, the challenge for DeFi is to get into the economy and start serving the economy in a sustainable, repeatable way, uh, uh, and uh, which brings real value to, to real companies and, and real users. Great. Well, I think that's a great note to end on and one I think we certainly agree with. So thanks you for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you, Swain.